I feel like my bra standards have like devolved. Not that I don't like high quality things, but honestly, like my only requirement is that like the bottom of my boob is not touching my like waist anymore. That's it. If I could just have something that just went like that, that's all I care about. Welcome to the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. The Asian Sewist Collective is a group of Asian people from around the world brought together by our shared appreciation for fiber and textile arts and our desire to see more Asian representation in the sewing community. In this podcast, we explore the intersection of our identities and our shared sewing practice as we create a space for Asian sewists and our allies. I'm your co-host, Ada Chen, and I'm recording from Denver, Colorado. Denver is a traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. I'm a Taiwanese-American marketer turned entrepreneur, and these days you'll find me running my all-natural skincare business called Chuan's Promise. That's C-H-U-A-N apostrophe S, Promise and sharing my marketing tips on my blog. Most importantly for this podcast, you can find my sewing at i.hope.so on Instagram. And I'm your co-host, Nicole. I'm based outside of Chicago, the original homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa people. I'm a Philippine-American woman, a lawyer by day, and a sewing enthusiast the rest of the time. You can find me on Instagram at Nicole Angeline Sews. Before we dive into this week's episode, Nicole, can you tell us about your current sewing project? Yes. I feel like listeners are familiar with me hesitating because I don't always have something I'm currently working on. Um, But have you ever signed up for something, Ada, and then forgot you signed up for it? Rarely, but yes, it does occasionally happen to me. I will say it happens a lot more to my significant other. (laughs) So I signed up to pattern test. Oh, no. Um and to, so and it I received it yesterday and it's with Stay Stitch Pattern Company. I really like the company. I like their designs. Um super beginner friendly. I had apparently signed up to pattern test through an Instagram story and I had pattern tested for them before, so I think it was like, "Oh, maybe this was a mistake." And so I emailed back and said, I don't remember signing up for anything. Um, I do actually think this will fit in my schedule, but I'm just sending it, letting you know in case it was a mistake. I'm like, no, you signed up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, let's do it then. Um, so it's a it's a bias cut skirt. Ooh. Um, so they're releasing one that's a midi length and then I think a mini length. I think I am not really comfortable with the idea of a bias cut mini skirt. I like I don't mind mini skirts. I don't believe in the whole if you're over 35, blah, blah, blah. But um, but the swishiness and like I'm just like, uh, I'll do the meaty. Uh, so that's what I am working on. I did print it and tape it together, and I'm going to be using a a leopard print, like slinky kind of material. I don't have a better way to put it. Maybe you would class it as a charmeuse. It's a woven. It's a woven for sure. Um, but I bought it from Melanated Fabrics when they first opened. Like there was a hyper oh. on the launch. And you will not at all be surprised to know that it's leopard print. So that is what I'm going to be working on in very short order. What about you? I am 0% surprised that it's leopard print. Every time I see leopard print, I think of you. Unfortunately, most of the ones I've come across lately are upholstery fabric, and I don't really think you want to wear that. Like, it's not it's not garmentable is how I would say. Fair. Maybe, maybe quiltable. Um, I am working on a wedding-related project, not for me, but for my friend, uh, Alexis, who is officiating. She has a bit of a harder time finding things that fit well, at least I think off the rack. We've we've kind of gone down that road just as her friend, like telling her what which dress of the five she's tried on she should wear to the wedding she's going to or whatever. And so um, as a thank you for being our efficient and helping me get my stuff together, I am making her a a uh, cheap out jumpsuit from Porcupine Patterns. I pattern tested that pattern um, way back, I think maybe like end of last year at some point probably six months ago and she is a different size for me so it'll be really interesting I have made the toile in muslin fabric I sent it to her 
when she was home visiting her parents. So she had an extra pair of hands to help pin and mark the muslin. And I sent her a prepaid envelope to send it back to me because while we were pinning and her mom was commenting on the arm side, I was like taking notes, but I was like, I really kind of need this back so I can see <clears throat> the exact measurements. Not that I don't trust your measurements, but like I kind of want to double check this. <laughs> so um, all the pieces obviously are cut because that's how I made the muslin, but she is, I believe the pattern's drafted for a B cup. She is larger than a B cup. I believe she's somewhere in the D range, although I haven't personally measured her and, you know, measuring yourself when that's not really what you do all the time can be difficult. So related to today's topic, but um, we are going to be making lots of different adjustments to the other the, I sized up and decided we would just start like hacking away at the pattern pieces. <laughs> so I have some of those notes written down, but I want to make sure that I get the muslin back so that I can compare them first before I cut into the paper, even though, you know, it's paper. I just don't want to tape it again, is what I'm saying. I know. I am definitely team cut. And I think it's because I'm not – I was thinking about this question about TNTs last night. I'm like, I'm very much a person that, like, will try one once. Even if I love it, I'm ready to try something new. So, I, like, I have ones that I've made a couple times. But um, when I when I do go back to – wanting to make another pattern again and if the situation calls for me needing to tape it again that's when I wish I had made different choices but I'm like too lazy to trace so I mean good for you but that sounds like a really neat project uh will you be sharing the final results perhaps after the nuptials I will I mean her outfit can be shared as long as she's okay with it being shared I'm actually the plan is once I get this muslin fabric twall back uh, to make her a second wearable twall in a similar-ish enough fabric to see how it would drape and kind of lie on her with all the adjustments because she actually she lives in Honolulu and so she's so far away I can't really go there to do fittings and sew it there um, so that's the plan we're just going to be mailing it back and forth for the next few months <laughs> I mean sounds like a good plan to me hopefully but today, I should turn it to our guest. We are really excited to welcome Lily Fong, a blogger, designer, and instructor of all things bra-related from Lilypad Designs, which is at Lilypad Designs 1D, so L-I-L-Y-P-A-D-E-S-I-G-N-S -S on Instagram. Welcome, Lily. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so happy that you're here. And we do ask our guests about their cultural background and if it influences their sewing process. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and how you got started sewing? Okay. Uh, I started sewing, I want to say it was junior high. Um, my uh, junior high actually offered a sewing class. And so it was one of those uh, rotational things, you know, before home ec and all that stuff got ousted from the school system. Uh, but um, it was uh, part of the rotation. So you got to spend a few months in home ec, a few months in typing class, a few months in wood shop. And so you got to experience four different um, crafting uh, related stuff within that time. Uh, and that's when I f used my fir very first uh, serger and kind of learned to read a pattern and all of that. And that kind of definitely started things. And uh, from there, started with costumes, Halloween costumes, because, you know, it's it, it seems silly. I'm like, why am I spending money on a costume that I'm only going to wear once that is mostly plastic or something of that nature and may fall apart on you on the night that you are wearing it? So I was like, you know what, maybe I'll just, you know, throw something together. Um, but in terms of my background in sewing my, I guess, Asian-ness <laughs> doesn't really uh, play a huge role in my lingerie making, although I do have um, some Asian brands that I take inspiration from that they're, uh, I really like their design elements. Um, and it has played a very important role in where my company went and how my design aspect uh, has evolved. Uh, but I will say that the names of my um, patterns 
are Asian related. Um, some of them. So my latest uh, pattern, I, hold on, the latest cat pattern, this one right here. <laughs> uh, this is called the Koma. That is uh, a Japanese name. Um, I believe it's botanical. The the meaning escapes me at the moment, but. Um, because I have, I don't have actual Japanese roots uh, from a biological perspective, but I am Taiwanese, and um, my grandmother spoke Japanese because of World War II, and she worked for a lovely Japanese couple, and so uh, Japanese culture was very much uh, ingrained in my grow growing up, which made things a little confusing when I got older. By the way, I didn't I didn't realize some of our uh, traditions were Japanese and not Taiwanese, and that was a big eye opener. Um, it's an adult. Okay, I have an actual bra related question, but can I ask a fellow Taiwanese question of like, do you call your grandma Ama or do you call her, um, uh, is it Oba chan? Oh, oh uh, I call her Ama. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, she's, she's Taiwanese, um, like Xiangxia. Uh, <laughs> so we, that's we, a, that's a, fr- for our listeners who don't speak <laughs> Mandarin, that's a phrase. It's, um, I don't want to say it's a little derogatory. It just kind of means that you're from the countryside. Yeah. Which is how I would describe parts of my family as well. Yeah. Um, that's interesting because my, I mean, we called my grandma the same ama, which is grandma in Taiwanese, but then we also, I know that. Some of my aunts and uncles, because they were older during the end of the occupation, um, they actually had they had to use all of the Japanese familiar familial terms. So they actually sometimes carried over um, and just would like slip out. (laughs) Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think it's it's colonialism. (laughs) Anyway, that's not the topic for today. The topic for today is bras. So you started sewing bra or you started sewing in junior high when did you start sewing bras like what led you to to that of all things from costumes right so uh this bra making thing is relatively new in my i I guess we're bordering on 25 years of sewing experience now uh within the last four years or so i did bras and like so many who start sewing lingerie it this was a need uh i needed bras that fit i needed bras that did not give me uh, large, dark, not welts, but like spots that cause major sources of pain. Um, and it was, this was one of those things where I didn't really know, knew, I didn't really know that I needed it until I needed it. I had basically stopped nursing. This was after child number two. I had stopped nursing. I was like, okay, time for some proper bras again. We'll do some pretty ones because I'm tired of the ugly, ugly beige monstrosities that uh, nursing moms have to deal with. And yes, they are seamless and they are functional, but gosh, they look terrible. Um, And I was like, okay, so now it's time for a proper bra. Let me try my old bra on. It's probably not going to fit, but let me see. Oh man, it was not not even close I'm like okay I might have gained some weight maybe some boobs came along with it so you know I go to the store and I figured you know what I'm going to try Nordstrom's I'm going to try a dependable department store that is known for the little old ladies in the fitting rooms who can just eyeball you and go you are this size and let's get a bra that fits you and we did get one that fit okay but it wasn't you know quite that um you know great it wasn't quite ideal either I, I thought it kind of flattened me out. I'm like I'm not big it's like let's not flatten me out any more than we need to <laughs> and um I stumbled upon um something called the uh a bra that fits and it is a reddit forum and there is a entire boatload of information on how to fit ready to wear bras, as well as how to adjust your current bras to be a better fit your body. And they're assuming um, small things like we can't change the cup volume to eat um, too much. But if your band is too big, you know, say the cup and the style that you want, it only came in that 40 and you had to sister size into like a 40 D I'm like, I need a 32 band. So they're like, okay, so this is how you take the band in. I'm like, oh, this is reasonable. I can do this. It's like a straight 
create stitch, I can hand stitch this, which is exactly what I did for that very first one. I'm like, okay, I, I have a sewing machine, but I'm like, okay, I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Let me just hand stitch this. Oh, this was much better. And as I kind of delved into that group more and more and kind of um, sort of learning about brush shapes and all the different um, uh, ways that bras are drafted and what shapes that they were designed for, I started making more and more adjustments. And at a certain point, I was like, I am spending so much time adjusting ready to wear bras. Like, why? What? Why? Why? And it's just, wait, I just need to make my own. I know how to sew. I've been sewing for <laughs> years at this point. And somehow it did not occur to me, hey, you know what? I can just make a bra from scratch. And then because I'm already making these adjustments and I had a, a better idea of what better fit my body. And so that whole thing launched from there. I do feel like that's a similar story to folks who found themselves pattern hacking a lot. And then they decided, I'm just going to go ahead and start drafting because I'm making all of these adjustments myself. So why not start from scratch? That's pretty cool. Also, some, re I mean, not all ready to wear bras are expensive, but many of them can be. And so if you're already like, first of all, I would be nervous to take any sort of adjustments needle and thread scissors to anything that costs like some of them I've seen like they cost like 80 to 100 dollars retail price like I would be so afraid to cut that and then be like well you can't return it because you cut that um so it kind of that does kind of make sense <laughs> to me so how did you get from I'm just gonna sew my own bras like I can do this to I'm going to start lily pad designs and have a whole company around this so that was a very uh, strategic move on my part. Once I realized, once I got a bra to fit me well, I'm like, this is a revelation. It, you know, it's, um, I don't know about you, I'm at the stage where boobs, when they are not supported in a bra, bra like anything, they sit on the belly. <laughs> you mentioned that earlier. They sit on the belly. And when it is sweltering, it, it gets to 110 degrees um, where I live in LA sometimes. Uh, and I mean, you have the AC on, but there's only so much that you can do. And you're sitting there at, at the table and you're, you're working on projects or whatever. And there's just the pool of boob sweat that is sitting on top of your stomach. And it's just, this is not going well. So you put the bra on, so it lifts it off your belly. And it's like, well, I mean, this is better. I don't have to worry about sweat, but you know, now I'm confined in a bra that doesn't really fit that well again. So once I got the bra to fit, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's lifted. It doesn't poke. It doesn't create an indentions where there shouldn't be. Um, and you know, when they're lifted, it's like, oh goodness, I look like I lost a little weight. I'll, I'll take that. Um, I want to do this for other people. Uh, as a profession, I, I have a master's degree in education, so I actually taught, um, <laughs> let's go into Asian stereotypes here, I taught algebra to middle schoolers. <laughs> um, so I was like, you know what, it's if I can teach other people how to get into a world that fits, that would make me so happy. Um, I also have a um, bachelor's degree in um, business. So this was my way of kind of merging the two. I can apply my business degree, I can apply my education background, and I get to work with people who are invested. They, If they are willing to sew, they're willing to learn. And as an educator, this is the best sort of people that you want to work with who are already interested. They already, they already have one foot through the door. Like they want to learn. I'm like, this, this sounds like a good idea. So I went into bra making, went into learning to draft and started my own company with the intention of teaching others. That was my goal. Uh, and it still is. I bet teaching people who are motivated to make their own bras and make them fit there. I mean, I guess you said like they're kind of an already captive audience, unlike yeah. middle schoolers who may or may not <laughs> be interested in algebra. Right, right. Is there a difference then you see, I guess, I kind of have all these questions, but is there a difference um, that you would say that's pretty noticeable between bra sewing or lingerie sewing and regular garment sewing? Yes, yes. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the skills are not transferable. 
unless you have made swimsuits and worked a lot with stretch fabrics, like high percentage of lycra uh, in them, and elastics, uh, specifically sewing elastics to uh, two piece of fabric together. So maybe um, ruching that sort of deal. It's not really. We all kind of start at the same place. The closest um, comparison that I've heard, and then it's probably the most accurate, would be sewing the bra cups to the the frame, the cradle portion, is closest to easing in a sleeve, right? Because you've got um, concur- concave and convex curves that need to kind of go together. And um, what I tell beginners, you know what, just use a ton of pins, use pins to your heart's content. Uh, if that's what makes you happy, because that's how I started. I'd had a bajillion pins every like half an inch <laughs> because again, concave and convex curves, like they don't like to stick together very well. And so it was just a ton of pins. And then as you get more comfortable with the curves, you don't have to use as many pins. And now I can get away with maybe two. You know, you get there. Ada and I, our face were it was like, whoa, too. I, I think I used 20 on like a swimsuit, whole, like armhole, armhole, just the armhole. <laughs> right. And it's, uh, it, I think it's experience and blind confidence. So learn your oh, wow. trade, learn, get your experience up with the cheap $2 fabrics right? That you don't care. Oh, oh gosh, I messed up. I'm just going to cut another one. No big deal. So, uh, you know, I, I stock up on the, the cheap muslins in the most hideous uh, prints ever because it was two bucks. <laughs> and, and and that's how I started with, uh, you know, making clothes. And I have that same approach with bras. It's like, you know what? It's, I just need to kind of train the fingers. You get the muscle memory, right? So I have never sewn a bra before. And uh, because I, you know, I'm like, mm, my only requirement is that, that the lift just to get that, you know, sweaty part, you know, mm-hmm. not sweaty. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've never thought about it before, but I, I have sewn swim. And of course, now I'm thinking about all the things that I hated about bra buying when I, when I started to feel like I needed to growing up and I've never felt like it all fits. And I'm like, oh, I think that maybe it would be great to, to try. Mm-hmm. And you've mentioned, so, so I have not sewn bras. I have sewn swim. So that was like, okay, maybe I can do this. Okay. You mentioned, uh, so working with stretch knits, uh, maybe a little bit of ruching experience. Are there any other like types of techniques or maybe things that people should brush up on if they're absolute beginners and getting started? Like, I mean, I guess perfecting your zigzag stitch or do you even use zigzag stitches in (laughs) sewing bras, that type of thing? Right. Uh, No, excellent question. Um, One of the things I really like about bra making and it's it's one of those garments that when you sew you really cannot escape making muslins so you can practice (laughs) uh, to your heart's content on your muslins Um, and you and I guess the the one thing that um, people may not uh, know if unless you actually have sewn bras before is you have to remember uh, bras are um, like kind of like swimsuits. They have negative ease, um, but the cups usually don't unless we're talking about a bralette. So it needs to fit your body perfectly, um, which means that fitting is really important. Uh, I know a lot of people we maybe initially shy away from making lingerie and bras in particular, like, oh my gosh, it's so tiny pieces. And like, I don't know how to even sew all that. Honestly, if you have sewn before any amount of sewing, you can sew a bra. The whole part is not sewing. The part that actually takes time and effort and thoughtfulness is fitting, right? I have no doubt that you, both of you, all three of you have enough sewing experience to sew bras. But the fitting, it's like, you know what? Maybe you might want a little a little help, a little guidance. Like, what do I adjust here? What do I do here? Um, and, and that would be the case for most sewists. So as we are looking to achieve a well-fitting bra, how would you define what a well-fitting bra is? Like, what are some things to, to try to, I guess, achieve while you're making it? Okay. Um, most importantly, it, it the, the answer actually depends on if you're talking about a wired bra or a wireless bra or um, bralettes, which I categorize as a separate um, 
uh, entity be um, aside from bra uh, wireless bras because the support system is a little bit different and you're mostly going for cute and comfort versus like I need to hoist these girls up um, but with wire wired bras which I think most of us have succumbed to at some point or other um, you want to have that little, uh, the bridge, that little triangle piece between the breast that should be touching your chest wall. It should not be sitting on breast tissue. Um, and that portion, I think for a lot of people, especially if you're more well endowed, can be hard to fit. Um, so that's number one, that needs to touch the chest wall. And number two, your band needs to be tight enough. It needs to be firm enough to actually counteract the weight of your breast. The uh, support of a wired bra comes from the band. So the majority of the weight, let's just say 70, 80 percent, just throwing it out there, um, should come from the band itself. It should not be coming from the shoulders. Um, the shoulder straps are just kind of like, oh, so they don't kind of fall over or fall out when I'm leaning over to pick something up or if I reached over on the shelf to pick up something. So it relatively stays placed, but the most of the uh, support should come from the band. So those are the two major things. Um, some other things, obviously, that, you know, the cup should follow the contours of your breast well. I mean, I think most of us see that. that that's probably the most important thing. What I find that the average person does not realize is that underwires come in different shapes, not just different sizes associated with your, uh, your bra size, but they come in different shapes entirely. So um, let's just say you have a plunge bra, right? One has lots of cleavage. You'll notice the wire is much, much shorter in the front. So you can kind of push the breast tissue in towards the center. But let's say you are more endowed and you are uh, needing more support. That wire is going to come up much, much higher in the center to fully uh, support the breasts when you are standing, walking, leaning. And um, some wires are a little bit more vertical. So the ends kind of uh, point straight up and down. And some wires, they point out to the side. So uh, the regular, quote unquote, regular wires are the ones that kind of point out to the side. So think of that as a, um, a semicircle. Right, so it's a half moon shape where it kind of um, flares out a little bit at the end, and then we have um, underwires that are more vertical. These wires are there because breasts come in different shapes. So that's another uh, thing that uh, maybe the average person's not aware of because let's face it, how many of us stare at different shaped boobs all day long? <laughs> It's like, actually, I didn't know that um, nipples came in different colors until I think my 20s. <laughs> well, like, I'm sorry, I'm not in the habit of looking at porno magazines and I didn't, you know, and then when you do see them, um, you know, on TV or magazines or whatever, they're either blurred out or they are, you know, uh, strategically placed so that just the nipple is covered. I'm like, what? what? You know, I have mine to look at and that's my only reference. And then I saw someone else, I'm like, oh, they're pink. Oh my goodness! Okay. Wow. So I am dying laughing because I have I know the exact moment when I realized that not all nipples were the same color. Like, same thing. Same thing. I was in college, and I, I we the movie um, Three Hundred. I, I used to love that movie. I still like it a lot. I appreciate it. But that was one of the movies where I went to the theater to see it multiple times because I thought oh, so it was like, just, like big screen. Oh, yeah, God, and I was like, <laughs> "Oh, I oh okay." And there's a scene where there's a, a a person that's an oracle that's like dancing, and I was like, "Oh, okay." And so I'm just like, I I think that's so funny because it's a very there was a very distinct moment in my life where I had that realization, and we are we're well off bras, but it's still really funny to share, to hear that <laughs> that someone else had that experience too. I was like. Oh, okay. Uh, great. We have, we have something to relate to. And I mean, lots to talk about, of course. And all of this talk of underwire, you know, I have, I gave up on the underwire game like years ago, because I'm just like, I can't deal with this. But what I'm hearing, Lily, is that digging is not a requirement for wearing no, underwire. No, no. Oh, man. Poking, poking in the, when you were saying they, they have different, they go more vertically. I have that, pro I'm not as well endowed as the two of you are. I do not have the boob sweat 
problem. Only, you know, only if I'm like really exercising will will it pull on my um, sports bra. But I have that problem where because they're smaller and a little lower and wider set, anytime I get a bra from ready to wear that has wires in it, the wires literally like poke my underarm rib cage arms to death. Like I will take it off and I will have like poke marks on my yep, skin. Yep, yes. I have scars actually in between my breasts from what you were talking about, Lily, that triangle. I have scars from like uh like pushing. And I'm why am I gonna look now? They're there. <laughs> like but um but yeah, I remember being like traumatized from one bra experience because I re- oh it was it was a front closing bra I think and so like whatever clasp was there really just didn't work and but yeah so so it's so encouraging to hear of course I knew that bra making was a thing but I've never actually sat and talked with anyone who is you know very much invested in making bras for people teaching people how to make their own bras so that they feel good in them and so that they like what they see whatever that is if you like what you see and how you feel like it's such a um profound thing to think about when it comes to bras because at least for me in my throughout my life because I haven't been able to fit them well it's just been like a meh experience so yeah this has been really cool it's almost like I think I mean you brought up the very common experience of your breasts change if you give birth your breasts will change your if you are nursing or you're not your breasts will change it's it's a whole you're growing a human it's a whole body changing experience like I don't know how else to put that but if you're if even if you haven't or you're just like going through body changes and fluctuations like my weight has definitely changed and my proportions have definitely changed over the last like 10 12 years to the point of like you know, when I first started needing to wear a bra to now, the sizes are very different. And so even, I think we just forget, right? Because we're so like, well, this is a thing I just need to wear. I'll just pull the size and just order whatever or try on whatever and kind of settle for mediocre (laughs) or less than mediocre stabbing and poking. Um, When you what you're pointing out is that you don't have to. Like it should it should be a structural garment that actually does help you lift that weight, literally. Yeah. So you brought up two very important points. Um, as uh, uh, as women, our bra size should not remain static. Your body changes and your breast changes multiple times throughout your life. Uh, And so, as you said, you should not be able to fit in the same bras that you wore when you were 17. (laughs) If you are, you are in the minority. That is not normal. the most of us because of, you know, either pregnancy or other body changes. I mean, something that I get to look forward to menopause your body will change again because your hormones changes. And so your your skin elasticity changes, your requirements change, and that definitely, the the hormones change which affects our breast tissue. And um, this is something that a lot of people uh, tend to not think about because it's not really talked about. But the other thing is uh, that you touched upon is we are so, so accustomed to just, oh, let me go to the store and just pick up the size. We associate our identity with a specific size. How many of us have thrown a tantrum in a dressing room because we didn't fit in our normal 24620 size uh, at a particular brand? And that's kind of the same thing with bras. It's like, well, I've always worn, you know, a 30D, a 40D, whatever the case is. And um, so that's my size. Well, our body changes throughout our lives, so that may not be the case anymore. Um, and that actually brings me into why my pattern does not use those bra sizes. So I don't use um, 40D, 30D um, as bra sizing because there is too much stigma, especially in the U.S., um, In the U.S. in particular, if you are larger than a D and just, oh my gosh, you were double teacup, you must be huge. No, 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 no. If you are a 28D, that's not a very huge cup size because a 28D is the same as a 30C, which is the same as a 32B cup. 
that's not huge. And even though that same um, breast volume is on a smaller frame, it still doesn't look huge. So those letters are kind of meaningless by themselves. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, because there's so much stigma, I am this size, I, I've always worn this size and whatnot. You know, I just said, you know what, forget it. I'm not going to use those uh, that sizing system. You want to uh, make your own bras. Again, I have a kind of a captive audience who are already interested and invested. I'm going to teach you a new sizing system that you can use to better identify what um, size to start with, what size to choose. I know that sewing has empowered me to think of measurements and sizes as just like data sort of really ignoring what everyone says a size is, even with the sizes on the on the pattern envelope or the pattern itself. Um, it took some work to break that stigma, you know, like, and even the idea that the higher the number or the higher the letter, like you're bigger, it should be like avoided. First of all, you know, of course, you know, that's very fat phobic. And, and I love how you normalize saying like, well, these don't mean anything. So let's get rid of those conventions so that people aren't, are only thinking about what works for them and their own comfort, as opposed to comparing it to what like the people at Nordstrom's would say the size bra is. So that's really cool. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your sizing, how your sizing system works? And if it's po possible, like how would you say someone who fits into like a 38B, which is which is generally me, uh, uh, as, as it were, I mean, it doesn't really work, right? Like it's all just kind of crappy, but um, like how, how does it uh, translate, I think, for folks who are just used to the common sizing, or maybe it doesn't, the and US, that's the purpose. Yeah, the U.S. American sizing, also US maybe American. even like, I guess you, you've, you've mentioned in our prep for this episode that U.K. and European sizing can be different. So like how, do, how does one kind of boil it all into using a lily pad design bra size? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, since you mentioned that, um, so for our listeners who are not in the U.S., like they, you don't understand how difficult it is. So in the U.K., bra sizes, you do A, B, C, D, double D, E, F, double F, G, double G. Like you just start repeating letters. You have the letter and you repeat it. Um, and so it's fairly consistent and you can... Uh, easily anticipate oh this is the next size this is this is what, what i know is going to be next in the u.s because we have um very uh, we have quite a few legacy companies um who when they first started i, I can't remember but i want to say one of the big legacy companies i want to say me was like made in form one of the really old companies created the cup sizing system and they only went up to a d and so as we got bigger and the breasts got bigger they just kept adding d's so you can be a 32D, 32 D, 32 double D, 32 triple D, 32 quadruple D. And if you are a 32 F in other countries, you are a 32 D, 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 D. Yeah. Yeah. So that doesn't help with this whole sizing stigma. <laughs> One of the reasons that my sizing uh, system is different is because to kind of avoid the, I'm, I'm always this size, so I'm just going to pick my normal size, basically forcing you to use your measurements. For those of us who have already sewn regular garments, you, know, you look at the size, but mostly you kind of ignore it and you turn the packet over and you look at the back and you look down the chart for your measurements. Uh, because for most uh, patterns, they are different than your ready to wear sizes. So my pattern's the same thing. You get to choose your size based on three key measurements. So that is your rib cage. That one's pretty standard. It's the same one that they use at the retail stores. The second one is your, um, what I call the horizontal hemisphere. So it is the horizontal measurement across the breast. So we're measuring just the breast, not your torso. Um, just a breast. So you may have two measurements, one for each side, because you know what? Mo a lot of women are asymmetric as well. Uh, so you have the horizontal measurements that will tell you your cup volume. And then you have the vertical measurement, which I call the bottom cup depth. And that is the distance between your underwire and your nipple. 
So if you think about the breast as a semi-hemisphere, as a, a as half a globe, you've got the horizontal and you've got the vertical measurement. And these two measurements will uh, identify your cup size. And then you have your rib cage size, and that is just your band size. Nice and easy. That's so smart. Having not made a bra, I have made swim, and I've made a certain bustier pattern that I may have mentioned on the last season, where the only measurement that overlapped with what you measured was the... Um, horizontal hemisphere and so I was fitting this bus- bustier trying to like figure out why this three-piece cup was not working and playing with the different pieces like this measurement is not enough I guess I was I was just fed up after a week of fitting refitting trying different sizes and then just had to bust it out because I needed to wear that dress to <laughs> So most most patterns will have you uh, measure your your bust um, two ways. You have the uh, over bust, which is the one where you go all the way around the body over your bust and underneath the armpit. It kind of feels weird. So that's the um, that's the upper bust uh, measurement. And the second one they use in uh, retail bra stores is you take your uh, measuring tape and you go all the way around the body and you measure over the your apex, your bust point, uh, and that's supposed to you know give you your size but what that doesn't account for is what if you have broad shoulders and small boobs then your measurement's going to be larger right or what if you have a very tiny torso and very large boobs you are going to have the same measurement as someone who has large shoulders and small boobs there is no way that these two people should be wearing the same size bra or that the cups would fit the same because they are very very different physically that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I now that you say it, I, I am that broad-shouldered kind of like smaller busted person, and it always like sometimes I got measured and they'd be like, "You're a 36C," and I was like, "That's that doesn't make any sense. There's too much volume in here. Like I don't understand what this means." <laughs> so, would you say that your system, since it kind of bucks the trend or the status quo of what we're used to, at least in the U.S., means that it's more size inclusive? Absolutely. Um, because it's you you take away some of that stigma. Um, and the, the whole sizing system is kind of a, a mix and match thing. Uh, in the same way that someone may be grading from uh, one bust size to one waist size to one hip size on a regular pattern, regular clothing pattern, you can do the same thing with bra patterns. So you can select one size for the cup, another size for the cradle, or that's the wire portion, and then another size for the back, uh, because you may have a larger or smaller rib cage than what the pattern's expecting. So you just kind of mix and match to uh, fit your needs. I have not, uh, I have to resist like looking down at my own chest right now because I as we're talking about it you know um also acknowledging it, it might be difficult for some folks to think about their bodies like th- this but I'm just I've not thought about fit and what I want in a bra like pretty much this in depth ever so it's really exciting to think about you know accommodating what mine are are like I believe I'm a b cup I'm definitely wide set so you know the 38 b I was kind of like I mean, it, that's kind of the best fit I've ever had, but it doesn't feel right. You know, so I'm like the idea of just like being able to have cups that are a little bit spread out, you know, like a little bit further out because you are picking and choosing from the different parts of the bra instead of just making one thing that fits one size convention. So you said you could do the the cradle, the cup and the back as all different things. I think I would need all that, but most people who wear bras probably do need all those different things. So that's, that's really cool. So for those of us who are a little intimidated by sewing a bra, like buying all the materials, getting started, we do want to point out that Lily does offer bra making kits on her website. They include all the materials you need to make that specific bra pattern. So if you're eyeing a Lily pad design uh, pattern, you can grab a kit to go with it. But Lily, I wanted to ask you for those uh, folks like myself, maybe Ada counts herself in this um, category, but who are wanting to dip their toes into bra making, is there um, a kit that you feel like would work for a beginner on your website? 
I sell something that I call a muslin kit. It uh, gives you enough fabric and findings of the elastics and all of that stuff to make three full bras. Uh, and it's, you know, everything is packaged and they're ready to go. It's not pretty. It's not cute. It's very plain, black or white, very utilitarian, but it is the proper materials with the proper stretch percentage. That's one less thing to worry about. And it will work with most bra patterns. Uh, so whether it's one of my patterns or someone else's, uh, the, the muslin kit will have enough for just everything. Uh, it's a it's a good place to start just because it can be intimidating because these are different fabrics and different elastics and different widths and stretch percentages that we have not thought about before. Um, I know when I started, I actually bought a findings kit. So that's just the elastics and, you know, the the rings, and the hooks and all of that stuff. And I used whatever um, scrap fabric from my stash to get started. Uh, it, it, it's kind of funny because my I went into this experience saying I've set myself a budget. I'm going to make my own bras using the same amount of money it would cost me to buy a new one. I just spent what it was like seventy dollars at Nordstrom's to buy this one bra that fits okay ish. So that was the budget I set. I have seventy dollars right now, and I included a pattern in that. And I'm just going to buy you know, whatever materials that within my budget, and you know see what I can do. And that kind of kicked things off. Uh, it just it was reasonable because how many of us have bras in our drawer that we bought? And we either never wear or it's the last one to pick up when everything else is dirty and in the laundry, <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay, I can spare the cost of one bra. I'll try it. This is my tester piece, right? It, there's like a bra hierarchy, I think. <laughs> so if we get started and we get a kit and we need more help with bra making, or maybe we're just like intimidated, can you tell us about uh, the additional services that you offer? I want this to be accessible to everybody. So I do have a little bit of a hierarchy. So if you are on a budget, you know, you can do everything yourself and that's going to be the cheapest method. Um, you can get uh, advice for free on any of the Facebook groups. Sometimes people will email me directly. Um, and so that is one tier. You can get help from me directly with photos and um, videos um, through my fitting session. And I can walk you through, okay, this is what I see and how it fits. These are the changes that you need to make. I have had some people um, tell me that uh, they've actually picked up, here's my pattern piece. What do I do? And I will show them and will draw the <laughs> draw the line and, and the change and what they needed to do because that was what they're requesting. Um, so it's it's a virtual session. So there's no need to travel anywhere. Um, you know, we tried, a lot of my sessions are on the weekend because this is, you know, the reality, you have to work on weekdays. And uh it's basically whatever it is you need. Some people um, sign up that session for fitting. Some people sign that session because they want to start their own business and they just want, you know, kind of uh, some inside info, I guess. <laughs> and every year, we were talking about this before, but every year there's a team of lingerie designers, suppliers, instructors, including you, that host the Great Bra Sewing Bee, which is coming up again this summer. I definitely, I attended the like re-recordings last year. So can you tell us about the conference and what's included and when we can kind of look forward to signing up for it this year? So I believe the details just came out on um, the website. I'm not sure what the, the other teachers are teaching, but I can tell you what I'm teaching. <laughs> So the Great Bra Sewing Bee is anything and everything uh, uh, bra related and sometimes panties as well. Uh, everything from how to get started. So there's an entire beginner session that you can take uh, that will talk about fabrics and patterns and uh, adjustments and all of that stuff. And then there's another category where uh, we talk about, hey, how do I make these adjustments a little bit more advanced or uh, how do I draft um a bra pattern. And in my case, I am teaching the first ever computer uh, related um, class. So that one is how to take your paper patterns and make it digital. 
uh, how to it, it, in a why you would want to do that aside from the space factor. But um, I'll also touch upon um, using the projector while sewing, uh, which is related to the, the computer drafting and all of that. I'm also teaching a class on where cosplay <laughs> crosses with bras and lingerie. So that one's going to be kind of fun. And uh, of course, on underwires. That is amazing. So for listeners who are interested, I believe by the time this episode is out, registration will be open, but registration opens June 1st and the great sewing, great, great bra sewing bee, say that five times fast, for beginners, the session that Lily mentioned is July 30th and 31st. And then the main conference. So if you have sewn a bra before, or maybe you take the beginner track first, that main conference is August 4th through 8th. And we will have links to sign up in our show notes. Is it a in-person conference? No, it's all virtual. You don't have to leave your house. And because it's international, you can take classes at 3 a.m. if you are a night owl. Very <laughs> cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about that. I don't think I've heard of it before. I am relatively new to the sewing community anyway, but um, Ada, I'd love to talk to you about like your experience because after today's discussion, I really am, you know, interested in I say that a lot don't I on the podcast but I mean really <laughs> a bra is something that a lot of people will wear on an everyday basis and I just like forego wearing because I hate it but I can learn to love it if I make one step in for me so we're really grateful that you're here today Lily um before we wrap up can you remind our listeners where we can find you on the interwebs so my website is www.lilypaddesigns.com that is one D and an S at the end. Awesome. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of the Asian Sewist Collective podcast. If you like our show, please consider supporting us on Coffee. Your financial support helps us with overhead expenses and allows us to give back to our all-volunteer team. You can make a monthly or one-time donation at ko-fi.com slash Asian Sewist Collective. You can find this link in our show notes, on our website, and on our Instagram account. Check us out on Instagram at Asian Sewist Collective. That's one word, Asian Sewist Collective. You can also help us out by spreading the word and telling your friends. We would appreciate it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, or wherever you get your podcasts. All of the links and resources mentioned in today's episode will be in the show notes on our website. That's AsianSewistCollective.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your questions, comments, or even voice messages if you want to be featured on future episodes at AsianSewistCollective at gmail.com. This episode was brought to you by your co-hosts Ada Chen and Nicole Angeline. This episode was researched by Shailen Joy. Produced by Shailen Joy. And edited by Serena Granger. And Henry Wong. Thank you so much to the other members of our collective who made this week's episode a reality. This is the Asian Sewist Collective Podcast, and we'll see you next week.